uh, we will move towards our first uh, panel discussion for the day. And the topic for the panel discussion is based on the DSS 2023. And we are going to focus in this session on strengths and opportunities in two-wheelers and three-wheelers segment. Dealership Satisfaction Study 2023 is the basis for the two panel discussions that we have arranged this afternoon for our audience. And we are starting with the first one. So in this session, we are going to primarily focus only on the strengths and opportunities that arise from this study on the basis of this study for the two-wheelers and three-wheelers uh, section. We will be having a panel of experts speaking on uh, these two areas particularly. The focus is clearly divided in both the panel discussions, which are both going to revolve around the Dealership Satisfaction Study 2023. The first one, like I said, focuses entirely on the strengths and opportunities in two-wheelers and three-wheelers category. So as uh, we arrange for our uh, panelists, who will be starting shortly with this discussion, I'm going to introduce to you our uh, moderator for the session, who will be Mr. Ketan Tucker, Group Business Editor, Autocar India and Autocar Professional. Along with him, we have our uh, panelists, who will be taking up the stage shortly. Please bear with us as we arrange for uh, the chairs for our panelists. And uh, let me quickly introduce our panelists as well. Dr. Uh, Amitabh Saran, CEO, Altigreen Propulsion Labs. Mr. Diego Graffi, Chairman and Managing Director, Piaggio Vehicles Private Limited. Mr. Ranvijit Singh, Chief Business Officer, India Business Unit, Hero Motor Corp Limited. Mr. Ravneet S. Pokila, CBO, Ather Energy. Mr. Siddharth Bapna, Co-Founder and Director of Blueverse India. Mr. Dharma Teja, Director of Nine Star Motorcycles, Bangalore Private Limited. I hope all our panelists are here amongst us. So before I hand it over to uh, Mr. Ketan Tucker to moderate the session, I'm once again going to announce the name of our panelists and request them to please join us on the stage. Dr. Amitabh Saran, CEO, Altigreen Propulsion Labs. Mr. Diego Graffi, Chairman and Managing Director of Piaggio Vehicles Private Limited. So please, as I take your name, uh, kindly join us on the stage. Mr. Ranjivichit Singh, Chief Business Officer, India Business Unit, Hero Motor Corp Limited. Mr. Ravneet S. Pokela, CBO, Ather Energy. Mr. Siddharth Bapna, Co-Founder and Director, Blueverse India. Mr. Dharma Teja, Director, Nine Star Motorcycles, Bangalore Private Limited. Once again, let me uh, remind you, the panel discussion that we are going to start with is going to focus on uh, Dealer's Satisfaction Study 2023 and the strengths and opportunities uh, in two-wheelers and three-wheelers section. Mr. Tucker? Thank you. Uh, I think we need to increase the volume of his mic. And also, uh, are we missing one guest? Um, should... Mr. Amitabh Saran, if you can hear me. Okay. He will be joining us shortly. Right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, 
the Indian automobile market has bounced back significantly over the last three years. You know, while passenger vehicle market is scaling new peaks, the two-wheeler and three-wheeler market has faced multiple speed breakers. With the GDP growth sustaining despite macroeconomic headwinds of inflation and interest rate, the two- and three-wheeler market has also started coming back and growing. In the last three years, the deal of fraternity has braved through multiple challenges of, uh, you know, going through multiple waves of COVID um, and, uh, you know, the bottom end of the pyramid facing challenges on uh, income. Uh, despite that, you know, we've seen market coming back. So we have with us uh, the eminent panelist uh, to discuss as to what's the road ahead uh, now that uh, we've started seeing uh, fairly better distribution of per uh, capita across uh, uh, the, the deeper parts of the country. Um, to, to speak about the prospects and challenges, uh, you know, I'd like to first begin with uh, Mr. Ranjivijit Singh uh, to just help, me, help us understand uh, as to, you know, what's been your assessment. Uh, the Indian two-wheeler market is yet to come back to its uh, uh, previous peak, yet it is on a good path now. And your dealer partners have faced uh, multiple headwinds. Uh, you've partnered them and you've supported supported them all through. Um, how do you see the strength of your channel at this point in time? And as we move towards better growth, uh, you know, what are the steps you would want your dealer partners to take in order to be ready for the future? Namaskar, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, last year, I really enjoyed our conversation. And when I got the invite uh, this time for today, uh, I just wanted to be here and therefore cleared up all other things just so that I can interact because I draw a lot of energy from, from the dealer community. And as an industry, we owe it to each other to interact freely, openly, transparently, and discuss not only strengths and weaknesses and opportunities, but everything very openly, and that's really the purpose of my being here. Very correctly said that, you know, the country has gone through a very tough phase during the COVID years, and then the country did bounce back. A lot of industries started bouncing back in 22, FY22. When you look at consumer durables, you look at airlines, you look at hospitality, a lot of that happened. There was a peak, FY19, for the two-wheeler industry that started declining. But important to know that it still took another year for the two-wheeler industry to start growing. And this is a true reflection of the GDP of where our population and where our customers truly are. And we need to be sensitive to them. So when we look at, you know, the economy, I think the biggest barometer is actually the two-wheeler industry. So when we started growing in 23, and now we are seeing the growth again in 24, it is a matter for us to celebrate. It is a matter for us to collaborate together. Someone said right in the beginning, there are tectonic shifts, there are changes which are taking place, and therefore it's time for us to innovate. And that's how we move forward. That's how we move forward. And that's the pain that has been felt by our dealer community in those years when we did not feel the momentum behind us to take us forward. We're now beginning to feel that now. But are we where we want to be? The answer is no. We're still at 80% of what the peak was, and no one is satisfied with being 80%. We need to do more. Of course, there are things which are beyond our control, like inflation. There are things which are beyond our control in the state of the economy or the agrarian uh, economy. But there are equally lots of opportunities as well. And that's what I wanted to just say. We are there together to be able to collaborate, to innovate, and then accelerate. And that is what FADA really stands for. Mr. Singh, the, uh, you know, how would you rate the strength of your dealer fraternity at this point in time? Uh, you know, like you said, the market is uh, reviving, uh, and uh, 
uh, they've had to brave through series of challenges. Uh, and what are the steps you've taken and what are the steps you'd like to take uh, to ensure that, you know, they are healthier and you work together to circumvent any other disruptions that you see in the future? Uh, the dealer community is our strength. Let me put that there. The OEM is one part of the hub, but the picture gets completed only with the dealer community, and we treat our dealer community as part of our family, and I'm sure the industry does that as well. So when you look around, we've got a full house of people from different parts of, you know, the extensions of the OEMs, very much a strength. When, when you come to the changes that are taking place, one of the biggest changes is with the consumer. They've got devices in their hands, the, the internet available to them all the time, and they know more about what they want to buy than even the people who are selling to them. They've done the, all the background checks. They've done the reviews and ratings. They've, they've seen everything. The only thing probably left is a test ride, and probably they've done that with a friend's vehicle. So they know more. How do we get ahead of the curve in terms of digitization? We've been investing a lot in our dealer community around that. The second thing we've been doing a lot is upgrading the skills and capabilities of our dealers. And that is paying huge dividends. And that, that capability goes across a whole spectrum of, of what, what is required to be ahead of that curve. And I think these kind of collaborations that we do, that we take ownership, that the dealer fraternity is really an extension and our way of reaching out to our end customer is the philosophy that guides us every day. And I'm sure the industry is also really looking at it in that way. Right. So uh, one of the disruptions uh, in the Indian two-wheeler market has also been the emergence of the electrification journey. I mean, uh, Aether Energy has been uh, leading from the front. Uh, uh, Mr. Fukela, you know, I'd, I'd like to get to know your view about, um, you know, very few mainstream electric two-wheeler makers have partnered, um, you know, and have begun with, uh, from the startup world, have begun with partnering the dealers. How has been your experience? Uh, you know, you started on a good note. There were some regulatory disturbances uh, with, uh, you know, fame to subsidies and, and all. Uh, the way things stand, how do you see the market? How do you see your, uh, you know, strength of your dealers? And how do you see the role ahead? Right. Thanks. So I think the market, uh, the market is uh, is on its upswing, and uh, while we had some challenges on the fame side on regulation with with subsidy coming down, and therefore the brunt of the of the subsidy coming down was shared between OEMs, which hit our profitability, and some we had to pass on to customers, which in turn meant higher prices, and therefore some two three soft months. But while on fame, while there is a short term pain in terms of financials. But, um, but if you take a little broader view uh, about the industry, it's actually a good thing because the fame subsidy levels, much as we like getting money from the government as OEMs, but those were unreal levels, they were unsustainable, and that didn't reflect the true reality of what the market pricing should be. So with the lower, lower prices, uh, with the higher prices and lower subsidy, we are closer to what would eventually be a post-subsidy world, and we need to migrate, whether it's the consumers or it's the OEMs, by way of our financials to be self-sustaining in a post-subsidy world. So to that extent, short-term it is, 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 is fine, but I think from a long-term perspective, it's, it's a good thing where we are. Uh, also, we've seen that you know, whenever there is any phenomenon that, that impacts the entire industry collectively, uh, consumers and markets bounce back quite quickly. We've, we've seen that in, you know, when insurance went pop or, or BS4 to BS6, uh, you know, jump, etc. So we already see that um, that in, in about a couple of months' time, if I look at the last two, three months' trends, is in a couple of months' time, as an industry, we should be at, uh, at the levels where we were before the subsidy uh, regime changed, right? So, and from then on, we start going again. So, um, so I think from an from a, a outlook perspective, nothing really changes for, for, for EV industry. You know, our product plans, supply chain, manufacturing, scale-up, distribution, um, roadmaps, nothing really changes. Medium to long term, there's been no change. To so that extent, there is optimism that still exists, and I think the market will keep growing, right? So because that, the ship has already sailed. Electrification as well as on its way. Most certainly in two-wheelers, uh, where uh, maybe there are some differences or different nuances in other categories. 
Now, when it comes to us, so we, uh, we originally began with the notion that we will go to the market ourselves. So the first store we opened uh, was a cocoa store. And then we opened another one in Chennai, which is also a cocoa. Uh, and then we very quickly realized is that uh, sometimes it becomes, when you're a startup and you're disrupting by your product and other things, sometimes you sort of get ahead of yourself and end up changing things that aren't broken. So a model where we hit the market through you know, dealer partners is not a broken model that we had to change and do ourselves. And we realized that very quickly. Within two stores, we said, you know what? We, I think we're just approaching it incorrectly. We, are, we need to scale at a certain pace, uh, at a certain level. Also, the fact that you know, we are a startup, we have we built great products, right? We have, we, we've not been in business for 20, 20, 30, 40 years that we know how to sell and sort of drive the market and grow category. And that's something that our partners have done for years with other brands. So we thought we were being just naive by not leveraging the power of the ecosystem and very quickly pivoted to a, a more dealer model, which is what we have at this point in time. So that's a primary model. So we are at a stage where we are, uh, we are growing our, our network. Uh, I would rate our, uh, you know, our network quality as extremely high. Uh, it's early days, uh, so our, our, our challenges are quantity and scale more than the quality. Uh, so we've grown at uh, a fairly steady pace. We haven't, we haven't succumbed to the temptation of uh, you know, opening multiple stores ahead of where the market is and then have challenges on profitability, et cetera, right? Sure, there are always variances where you know, somebody's making less money, somebody's making more money. But the fact is, with the, with the long-term outlook is clear, uh, importantly, partners who've come on board haven't come on board just looking at where we are today. They come on board understanding and expecting and, and, and with optimism of, of the future, which is why you know, there, is a, there is belief in the, in the future. And therefore, when there's belief in the future, then the short-term hits that you may have seem inconsequential because what you see at the end of the tunnel is a, uh, is a, uh, is a big upside, right? So, so we continue growing. Uh, we continue building a network. Uh, just last point on this one is uh, also in, in terms of a network journey. We've also sort of had a few, um, I think, if not pivots, maybe, maybe pivots is a strong word, but just our approach to network. Uh, as a new brand, you know, uh, we were looking at partnering with very, very large players. Uh, a, because we felt that you know, they would get the institutional knowledge that we as a company don't have. And secondly, early stage, you want the, also the credibility of a, a big partner to come in so that you know, there is a larger trust in the ecosystem. And then we went, as we realized that it, it, there is no necessary mantra that has to be bigger or small partner. So there are various nuances, various markets uh, have dif different, different kinds of partners, different kinds of strength. Uh, as a result, today we have a fairly balanced network. We have large corporate, we have individuals, we have mid-sized. And I think we're in a pretty happy place there. The revenue streams can be very different for the electric vehicle space. You know, how do you, uh, there's still a big question mark with regards to residual value. Uh, the amount of money a consumer is going to pay uh, in its uh, ownership life cycle. Uh, you know, how have you seen those elements? And how can a dealer capitalize on this entire transition towards EV? Mr. Pokila, I'd like to get your view first, and then I'd like to get Mr. Singh's view as well. So I think the important thing to realize is that you know a lot of people speak about you know service revenue being low, et cetera. That's true, but that's not a surprise. It's not like we suddenly discovered it recently and then now we're scrambling to find a solution. Even when we made the business model, when we work with partners, we, we projected and extrapolated certain service revenue. Um, and, and it was on the conservative side, because one thing what people don't realize is that at this stage where we are, there is no leakage. There is no corner store where a, a guy can go. Whoever wants to get his service has to come back to the OEM. So the service revenue is, it can't compare with, uh, with, with ICE, but it, it's not as low as what uh, you might imagine it to be. But either which way, it was anticipated and projected in the business plan, and therefore the margin structure that we had uh, it recognized this, uh, uh, this vulnerability on the service side. In addition to that, there are things that still flow in, right? There is still an accessory which we're scaling up now. We, we, we are a pretty healthy per vehicle level accessory number then there are the value added services. Then we have, while we haven't really started monetizing in a big way, but just the ability of, of an EV to monetize things that maybe ICE can't, right? There are value added services on the software side, upgrades, new features, et cetera, which if you, if you look at uh, in, uh, mobile phones as an, as an inspiration, it became a lot of free stuff on the vast side, but eventually they were paid services, right? And there is no reason to believe why we can't migrate there. So the idea is, see, service or not is a means to an end. The idea thing is there's profitability and enough profitability for the channel to be motivated. 
and we, the, the flavor and the, and the sources of revenue might change, but revenue still is there, there's no question. Right, so the way the revenue mix is going to change is going to be different for an electric vehicle player is what you're trying to say. Uh, Mr. Singh, I mean, are you, you're going to be straddling both the ends uh, with your core being ICE, and, but you, know, you have larger ambitions for the electric vehicle space. Uh, you know, how, how can you ensure that uh, you know, an, a dedicated EV uh, partner, if eventually who comes in, you know, he's still able to make as much money or good money as he would for the ICE vehicles? So the first thing is, as the shift and transition takes place, it's very important for us to understand what the needs of the customer are, who are the customers, are they coming from other planet? They're not. They're probably out there. They're also currently two-wheeler users, and there's a lot of first-time users coming in, in a very similar way to how they have come over the years and decades into the ICE business. Once you understand that, <clears throat> and the motivation that drives them, then you want to really make it seamless for them, and even more importantly, for this transition, and what's the conduit to that transition, is our dealer network, right? Is our dealer fraternity. And therefore, at least at Hero, we have said that this entire transition conduit to the customer is going to happen through our dealer fraternity. And what that means is brilliant economics straight away. Brilliant economics means that infrastructure is already available, that expertise is available. What you do need to do is to adapt. How do you upscale? How do you upskill? How do you amortize? And how do you really bring those facilities to be able to, in a way, pivot towards a new customer need and a new technology shift that happens? And I just want to say another thing, which is, when you look at specifically, and your question was a little bit more about service, and I'm sure everyone here knows it better than, than, than I'm going to explain it, there's an 80-20 rule in service as well. And that 80-20 uh, rule is that the free service and the warranty is probably only 20% of the customer lifetime value that you get out of service, at least on ICE. And therefore, there's an ongoing monetization that happens over paid service over the lifetime of a customer. What's the value of that lifetime that comes from service? It's not trivial. Absolutely not. It's quite significant. It goes from 30 to 50 percent over a lifetime across different kind of segments, across different kind of models. It plays out. So what is in our mindset is really about the customer acquisition cost and building trust. The customer acquisition cost comes in the beginning. Over a time, that monetization starts playing out. How do you take that forward to the transition that will happen into the EV space is a very interesting question, and I think Ravneet addressed that very well. So I think overall, when you're looking at service, it's a core part of the proposition of anyone who's buying a, a mobile. It's pretty much a device with a service attached to it. Now, as far as connected is concerned, even at ICE level, more and more vehicles are becoming connected. We will know more about what the customer usage is, what the predictive analysis is possible, and how to therefore create a great customer experience for that end customer through the connected vehicle. It's happening in four-wheelers, it's happening in EVs, and it's happening in ICE. So from an industry perspective, I think there's great progress that we are seeing. How do we gear up for that? How do we shift gears to make sure that we capitalize on that opportunity, not at a concept level in the head office, but at every single dealership, which is truly the primary contact point with that customer, is where the magic will happen. Right. So the scale of Hero with the ICE network will ensure that, you know, that scale helps even on the electrification transition journey. Exactly. I mean, you, you said it extremely well. I was staying a little away from talking about Hero, but that's what distinguishes the brand, the company, is our dealers. You look at the number of touch points, it is the largest in the country, probably the largest in the world, and that scale is what gives the power for, you know, for that kind of a relationship with the customer through our dealer network. Right. Uh, Mr. Teja, you know, you cater to a market uh, where I believe there are about uh, 
with the brand that you have about 40 odd uh, uh, you know outlets uh, you know and uh, over the last few years you've seen ups and downs from your perspective uh, you know how have you uh, gone through these challenges given the fact that unlike a passenger vehicle where there's over dealerization there's this element of sub dealers uh, that exist in the two wheeler space um, what have been the challenges that you faced uh, over the last uh, few years with rental costs going up, with uh, employee costs going up, yet the volumes have not yet uh, reached the peak of what we have seen in the past? Uh, so, so the challenge in, is probably different in urban and rural. Uh, what happens in an urban landscape is uh, the customer doesn't travel beyond five or six kilometers. So you have to have a location or, or a touch point. Better? Yeah, okay. So the challenge in an urban landscape is that uh, the customer doesn't travel beyond a few kilometers, say about five kilometers. You have to have a touch point every five kilometers. So the cost of infrastructure goes up significantly. And obviously the kind of uh, manpower that we need uh, with the cost of manpower also going up. I think for us, the business model, instead of looking at unit economics, I think we have to start looking at cost and revenue per square foot of the infrastructure that we are actually operating in. Yeah. For example, most of, uh, I mean, it is probably true in the case of even four-wheeler as well. In the service, in, in, in service, uh, in, in the workshop or service areas, most of the place is taken up just for parking. So the, the vehicle is left in the morning, it doesn't go back until evening, and most of my infrastructure is just used up for parking. I'm not really you know, earning anything out of it. And in places where the cost of infrastructure goes up, it's not really, we are not able to monetize the space. Right. So that is one challenge that we need to look at. And also with secondary network, uh, they don't necessarily bring in the uh, working capital as required. So obviously there is a, a challenge in that, that uh, you know, a lot of dealers end up giving credit, uh, which collecting back is a problem. So those are the challenges we have faced. And uh, getting skilled manpower is a challenge. Uh, once we get somebody trained, the smarter folks tend to switch to four-wheeler at, at the minimum. Right, and those guys are, the guys who are not so smart end up staying back with us. But the customer expectations are increasing by the day, right? right? So if you look at an average ticket value, if you, if, you look at the pre, if you take out the premium products, the average ticket value of a two-wheeler is today very similar to a high-end cell phone or probably a white boot, you know, a, a big size TV or a refrigerator. So the expectations of the customers are also that bearing the ticket value in mind, yeah. somebody comes for a two-wheeler service, he wants it like in an hour or two. I mean, maybe I can turn around a few vehicles, but not all vehicles, right? So there is pressure on the customer expect. Trying to balance this has been a challenge in the last few years, post this internet and devices, right. post Swiggy, Zomato taking over everything is expected. And in places like Bangalore, Delhi, you have Zepto, Blinkit, which are giving services in 10 years, uh, 10 minutes, sorry. So that is, that is the competition that we are facing as an industry. Is, is a sub-dealer a support or uh, a challenge? I think it depends on the quality of sub-dealer and the volume that they bring to the table. Uh, I cannot say across, uh, whatever statement I make may not be true across the board. But yes, in some cases, it is a good support, and in some cases, it's a drag. Uh, Mr. Singh, I'd, I'd like to get your views on sub-dealers. Uh, I believe, depending from brand to brand, they range from 20% to 50%. In a two-wheeler market where margins are sub-5%, uh, and costs going through the roof, uh, and just, Mr. Teja just mentioned about uh, also the element of stocking, and there's always this debate about uh, whether to look at wholesale numbers or retail. So first, I'd like to get, you, uh, get, to, uh, uh, you know, get your views on uh, the sub-dealers. How critical are they? Or are they really dragging the 
uh, profitability of your uh, channel? I mean, how can you capitalize on them or how can you, um, you know, avoid the, the challenges that they pose to the dealer fraternity? So firstly, I think it's a very, very interesting dynamic in the automobile industry to have this distribution model and I'm sure there were choices to be made that were probably not made earlier. Uh, I, I, I worked at FMCG companies, which have a very typical retail distribution system that supply to the retailer, and there are CNFAs or stockists that supply to the retail distribution uh, uh, to, the, to the distributor. I've also worked at consumer durables, which also have a very similar thing. So the you know the area of operation is pretty much carved out. You know what you're in for, and then there are dealers. And, and then there's a wholesale market beyond that. Uh, that was not the case in automobile when I came in, into, the, uh, into, into the industry, and I th found it very, very interesting. And that, for, that is another thing which I, which I sort of discovered, which is the ratio of number of dealers to sub-dealers can stretch from 1 is to 5 to 1 is to 6, right. something like that. And then the contribution that's coming in from the sub-dealers from the secondary networks is stretching even beyond 50 to 60% in, in that range. So it, it really becomes a very, very interesting dynamic for us to think about. So what does that really mean for the automobile industry and for our dealers in particular? There are two roles that the dealers are performing, and you know it better than me because you're living it every day. There is the dealer who's, you know, providing for that customer experience to that customer who comes in, and also providing then as a distributor to the sub-dealers. Those sub-dealers, what do they do? Where are they? they? They provide that dealer reach. So there's an expansion that's happening. What does expansion mean? Very broadly and to its simplest level means one thing, growth. They provide the growth. They provide the opportunity to access a customer in that locality in that rural area, in that far-flung area, extension area, that would not normally come to the dealership and would have then otherwise gone to some other uh, uh, brand choice. And therefore, that growth, if you bring in that mindset and you start thinking about, so what are the margins that we are sharing, it's less about that and it's about incremental ROI. What kind of incremental ROI can you stretch from that kind of a capability? But you know what? You cannot think that they are equal to you in terms of their capabilities. So what is the customer experience that they're going to provide? What is their financial capability? What is the legal compliance that they have? What is the process adherence that they have? And what kind of engagement do they have with you? These are the questions to ponder about. These are the questions that if you take the mindset that they are taking away margin from you, then you'll keep them at arm's distance. But I have interacted with a number of such secondary network dealers where the dealers have put their arms around them and say, you know what, you're, you're my family. And if you're my family, I'm going to support you. And we didn't stop there. We said it's not only about the dealer. What is the biggest weakness that the secondary network has is the lack of capital, right? Is the lack of capital for a number of reasons. We all know what those reasons are, but their books don't allow it. So what do we do about it as an OEM? We provide that capital through the NBFCs and through the uh, uh, fintech companies. When that happens, funds flow in from those secondary networks to whom? Who do they come to? To our dealers. What does that alleviate? The profitability. What does that create? Rotations. That's where it's going. So if you think about it that one is to five or six is the number of sub-dealers, but one is to one is the kind of ratio of the revenue that's being returned on here, which is purely incremental, in a way, then the choice that you have is to have a growth mindset or a cost mindset. And that, for you, is your choice. Once you take that decision in the audience today, we have, from Hero, a dealer who was part of the secondary network. They came in and got upgraded to a dealer. Like this, we have lots of examples, right? So it's a growth mindset that will carry us forward. And that's what I'd submit to you. But do you think it is more of a reactive move rather than a proactive move? Constant debate within the dealer fraternity and the industry about 
the push on wholesale or retail. Many a times they've been compelled uh, to push the stock into the secondary channel because they don't want to carry that stock uh, and with the cost moving up. And also from a brand perspective, uh, you know, there's always this compromise on how a sub-dealer would treat your customer vis-a-vis -vis your own dealer partner may. So just both these elements, if you could, uh, you know, shed some light on. Hi, Diego. Welcome. So just uh, continuing with that. The, the customer experience and also the entire element of, uh, you know, wholesale push versus uh, a retail. So again, when you think about, at a very, again, broad level, wholesale versus retail, uh, Ashutosh is in the room. He is the national sales head for Hero. The only, only conversations that I have with him are on retail. I don't have conversations with him on wholesale, on dispatches. And the only thing I look at because of the way the company is, is that we've got to get a focus on retail. If that happens, everything else is, else is sorted out, right? And, and, and that's, that's first principles. That's absolute, that's been the, the philosophy that I've grown up with, literally, in the companies that I've worked, and I'm so happy to see that totally embraced at Hero. When that happens, also when you look at, I was talking about the way the industry, the two-wheeler industry has shaped up over the last couple of years, where there's been an overall decline from the peak of FY19 downwards, and now finally we're seeing a little bit of a turnaround coming in. When that happens, we have to adjust. You cannot go at the same space of pushing when the market is not as robust as it used to be. And so what did we do? In the last three years, we have reduced our inventory. We have reduced our inventory. Last three years continuously, even this year, even with the OBD transition, we have reduced our inventory. And that leads to a more healthy ecosystem with the dealers. That's the basic point. Now, I'm not saying that there won't be anomalies dealer to dealer in specific cases, and we are there. If that was not the case, what would be the need for people like us, right? So we will, we will adjust for those as we go along, but overall, the focus is completely on retail. Then you come to the secondary network. We spoke about one of the biggest weaknesses of the secondary network is the lack of capital. There's nothing you can do about it in terms of pushing. Very little you can push there. I, I think it's a credit risk. There are, people have risk appetite and people don't have risk appetite. And why would you want to take that kind of a risk? I mean, that's your decision completely. It's a choice that you'll have to make. So secondary network doesn't succumb to that. It's the dealers that have to bear the most of it. And as far as we're concerned, we're very sensitive on that aspect. So overall, health of the dealer ecosystem is the number one priority for an OEM, and I would imagine that would be the case for across the industry. Right. Yeah. Welcome, Mr. Graffi. Uh, uh, you know, Piaggio has been uh, playing a critical role when it comes to uh, three-wheeler space, and uh, electrification has disrupted that segment more than any other segment in the market. Uh, what's been your experience so far? And uh, as the revenue streams are going to be very different uh, with the electrification, how can you protect the interests of the dealers that uh, you know, they can still continue to make healthy margins and money uh, as the market transition to electric vehicle space. Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to this, uh, to this session, and sorry for joining late. Anyway, coming to uh, the subject of, of your question, definitely they had to say that the journey that we have as, as Piaggio, but as entire trailer industry, we have been completed uh, since uh, 2019 into electrification of uh, three-wheeler has been definitely amazed. Uh, we were not expecting such uh, very, very huge response and volumes have. Now, if you see a statistics of, of retail in the month of August, I think that more than 50% of the registration Pan India have been now in EV and no other sector Actually, in the entire uh, automotive industry in India has been uh, reaching such high value. That means that definitely there, is, uh, there, there are multiple reasons for customer to choose and select for this kind of, of solution instead of conventional IC solution. The, the definitely incentive, uh, wide incentive availability at state level and government level, thing to incentive are definitely very, very helpful in this perspective, but not only that. Also seamless, let me say, experience when driving a vehicle, low maintenance, um, 
TCO uh, and, uh, and better rentability in terms of, uh, for, for customer perspective, respect to conventional IC solutions. So, due to this definitely multiple reasons, I, I think that the, the growth path of three wheeler in uh, going forward is, is uh, I look at it very, very, very positively. Uh, and Piaggio in this, in this perspective definitely has been apply, playing a, a pivotal role in helping the industry to, to this kind of transition. For what is concerned, let me say, dealer experience, I think that definitely, they, in, in, at least for what is concerned Piaggio experience, we have, uh, we have seen a big percentage of our dealer network responding very positively to availability of, of this vehicle, but it's definitely completing their portfolio. Uh, were to say that in Piaggio we have uh, traditionally a, a philosophy of being full agnostic in the sense that we want to provide our customer whatever is the best powertrain solution that is available in terms of technology. And definitely with EV, we have been completing somehow this, uh, this picture and this scenario. So we are providing our dealer, let me say, multiple opportunities, uh, how to say, to, um, to, to, to develop business and to meet customer expectation. And furthermore, I would say that also we, Battery Swap, hopefully coming forward more positively, there will be also additional source of revenues because we are providing to a uh, to, to lot of our dealers the possibility to install swapping station at their, at their premises so that it can be definitely an additional source of revenue also for them. Right. So additional source of revenue through swapping is how you see uh, the dealers will be able to make money. I mean, is there a need for higher margins uh, in the electrification space, uh, Mr. Graffi? And I'd like, like to get the other people's view as well. Ma, uh, being the ticket size of every vehicle definitely higher, uh, also the, the dealer margin when, uh, when, when selling an EV, at least for what is concerned, Piaggio experience definitely is higher respect to, uh, for example, a conventional CNG. So for him, let me say, for, for our dealer, having this vehicle in, kind of por in, their, in their portfolio is also an opportunity to increase their, and streamline their revenues, at least with us. Right. Uh, Mr. Singh and Mr. Bokela, I mean, I'd like to get to start with Mr. Singh. I mean, do you think that there is a need to have a higher margin percentage because, again, the, the revenue to be earned through service and uh, with quality of vehicles becoming so good, you know, there are free cost of service. I mean, uh, the service intervals have been uh, getting stretched. Uh, uh, is there a need to relook at the margin structure for the dealers, especially with electric vehicles? Look, the uh, profitability of the dealer is something that absorbs a lot of our attention and therefore the health of the distribution system, if that is good, the outcomes are always is good and what's right and what's fair and in a, in a country that's as geographically spread as India and as diverse as the country is, uh, what works in one place does it need to work in the other place and how do you balance that out and what are the diverse revenue streams that are possible and there's an ongoing exercise on that to show that there are many aspects of service and I touched about this earlier, the 8020 rule about the lifetime value of a service revenue that comes in and what that can contribute towards as you go along and between you know 30 to 50 percent of the cost of the vehicle can be the lifetime value coming from service and then there's parts and, and, and all of that coming in. There are also other value added services that come in whether it's the RSAs or the joyrides and various others and there are some financial products and as you go on, on to retail finance which is becoming more and more robust and becoming the way in which you fight inflation and make it easier for the customer to come in, there are many, many different revenue uh, streams that, that uh, go on. We're also looking at the cost optimization side, not only from a margins perspective to increase the profitability from, from the revenue side, but also from the uh, cost side. And, and then also then looking in, into the other aspects of ESG that are big priorities for a company like ours. So looking at green dealerships and making sure that we have green energy, green processes, green products and digitization, all of which build a more efficient system for uh, the dealership. Uh, working out FSC margins or free service margins is, like I said, an ongoing, it's never a stationary thing. You never, it's not, not like you take an X-ray and say, now this is it and done and over, over with it. You work on it. What are the uh, labor rates that, that prevail? And what kind of indexation do you want to do that on FSC, on warranty, on paid service, and then build it up so that our dealers are 
are, are, it's, it's meaningful for our dealers to be able to keep investing in that area and getting the kind of returns that they need to uh, get. So it, that these are adjustments that happen pretty much all the time, uh, whether it's on the two-wheeler uh, two, uh, two vehicle sales or on the service part or on the parts and all of that is a continuous review mechanism. You can imagine in an enterprise like ours, and I would imagine that we are not singled out in this, that the industry does look at these things and partners with the, uh, uh, the, the dealers. One of the biggest things, and I said this right in the beginning, is about being open to feedback, about being really having a trusted environment and having the dialogues that where there is pain, you need to address that and do it in a very logical and rational way. And that's the philosophy that we subscribe to. So as we get into, let's say, electric, what are the economics out there? What are the industry best practices? How does it relate with the nascency that, that, that this new industry has compared to ICE? Again, these are the things that are benchmarked, studied, and then rolled out. And we are still a sort of, I would say, a new player on the electric space. And you know, there are a lot more experience in, yeah. on the panel here on, on that yeah. side. Mr. Fokela, I mean, uh, you moved from COCO model to the dealership model, and I'm sure you would have tried to break the mold of how you see the entire revenue stream for the dealer. Uh, I mean, is there, a, is there a case for a higher margin structure when compared to a conventional ICE? Or you think that the bouquet of services post uh, the ownership are way too many to ensure that dealerships have multiple revenue stream to ensure that there's sustenance there? So, it's slightly complex and it'll, uh, it's a slightly long answer, so please bear with me. Um, no matter what I say today, it is still an evolving industry, right? Um, so, other than, and we have no reference point, ICE versus EV, because EV is the only thing we do, so I have no reference point like that. But if you look at, uh, from first principles, so there is a certain investment that goes into creating a certain kind of retail experience that we want to provide. And then comes at a cost, and against that cost, there are certain revenue that we need to target. In that target, in that review overall, there are certain things which we can't influence or don't want to influence. For example, service revenue, we will simply model what we think is happening. I'm not going to force customers to get more service or do more spares, et cetera, because that's detrimental, right? Then there is you know, revenue around insurance, finance, blah, 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 accessories, all that you bake it in, and then you'll see, okay, this is the gap which my margins need to, need to fill, right? Whatever it comes to, it comes to. But the important thing uh, and uh, the complexity that we have is that when you, when you model any, any business model, so you have to extrapolate a certain revenue side of you know, throughput per, per store. Now today, I don't know what that number is because it's an evolving market. We assume that you know, uh, tier one, two, three, four would have a certain number. Somewhere we underestimated, somewhere we overestimated. Right. So when I look at a business model, if I have a conversation with one of our partners, let's say, who's not profitable, my first question is, listen, first, let's first agree what your rightful potential is. Are you going to be selling 200 units a month, 300, 400, or 50, right? And at your steady state, if you're still not profitable, then let's have that conversation. But if at steady state you're, you're profitable, and today you're not, then let's decide how do we get to that steady state number. So it's very difficult for me to have a very firm view on right or wrong because there are a lot of moving parts here. And the only way to get it done is to, is to as he said, be in, in dialogue and have an open mind with, with our partners, right? So, you know, somewhere we under, underestimate cost, somewhere we overestimate cost, somewhere we under, underestimate complexity. And, and already we've seen that even though we are a young company, that we have gone through some changes because we just got some things wrong, right? And there is, there is no shame in saying we got it wrong because we are a startup, we are learning, right? As long as there is openness to change, yeah. which there is, right? Uh, so I'd say that we are still some time away where I know for a firm that this is cast and so on, this is the model, but I think we are evolving as we are going along. It's, it's still, uh, you know, we are in still a discovery process. Yes, absolutely. Right. Because listen, if, my, if, if the industry has the potential to grow 20% month on month, 15% month on month, where do you peg your steady state? Like what is steady state? I don't even know. Right, finally, Mr. Bafna, you know, uh, a lot of uh, discussion on ESG and uh, circular economy, this push towards net zero. Um, uh, you know, I mean, eventually all vehicle makers will have to ensure that their ecosystem is well equipped with, uh, uh, you know, zero emission from a bluer's perspective. You know, how do you see this entire transition? 
and uh, what are the potential opportunities that you see from an ecosystem perspective uh, which can uh, be win-win for both uh, the channel partners as well as COEs? Thank you, Kazan. And uh, <clears throat> thank you, everybody. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, so from a Blue versus perspective, uh, just since we're a very new entrant to the industry, would like, uh, you know, just to introduce to everybody that we've spent close to five to six years uh, doing a lot of R&D and research. And we finally went to market about three and a half to four months ago. And from an ESG perspective, like the panelists have already laid down the bedrock, there are a lot of moving parts, you know, right from urban to rural to rising manpower costs to attrition rates uh, to sustainability being the global buzzword, right from UN to India to mission life. G20 was all about it. <clears throat> ESG uh, being a very big keyword as well. And I think it's all translating into something very tangible. It's very easy to get lost with so many moving parts, but I think if you were just to go direct and straight to the point, how can the ecosystem benefit? How can the dealer network uh, benefit? I think a very recent regulation by SEBI uh, came out, which uh, I think started back in 2012, uh, updated regulations in 2015 and 2023 in June. Uh, we just had an updated regulation which states that uh, all the OEMs or listed entities, etc., across India, now not only have to report up to their factory level. So earlier, you know, all the industries went to ZLD, etc. But now the entities need to report 75% upstream and downstream, all the way up to the dealer network, service network, suppliers, purchasers, etc. I think that would inst inst uh, you know, inst uh, instigate a lot of discipline and a sense of responsibility amongst the entire ecosystem and uh, collectively take over the challenges. I wouldn't lie, ever since we've gone to the market, uh, we've uh, had at least 20 things hitting us every single day. But yes. we've, we've tried, as a, being a startup, we've been very agile and very innovative. And uh, we would love to you know, share with the audience that <clears throat> one of our dealer sites in Bangalore, uh, we actually ended up reducing their water cost from an astounding 20,000 rupees a month to 650 rupees a month. Wow. Uh, and that was a nearly a 98, 99% reduction. And across all our sites, we ended up collecting all the hazardous waste, all the water. So I think collectively put together, uh, service is a very sticky business. I think, uh, like Mr. Singh rightly said, the lifetime value of a customer, you know, uh, just about starts the moment you sold a product and you convert your entire uh, cost of consumer acquisition to, into a service-based ROI. And how do you build a service-based ROI is typically by, I think, creating a lot of engagement, a lot of stickiness with your end user. And I think vehicle washing, which is our primary go-to market, but I think along with a lot of ancillaries, could be a very key, uh, key facet in terms of building stickiness with the end user and constantly bring them back. And that has been one of the key learnings. And yeah, we are here to learn and constantly work closely with the dealer network and the OEMs towards being able to uh, adopt innovation and technology and funding, funding the delta and the viability gap. Right. Uh, Mr. Teja, you know, is that the future, the service-driven revenue? Uh, on one hand, your margins are always under pressure, especially with an expensive city like Bangalore. Uh, you know, is, is that the way forward? And uh, you know, how do you see the entire ESG angle? And like Mr. Singh mentioned, that eventually, you know, it is, and, and like how even uh, Mr. Bafna mentioned that, you know, it's going to be upstream and downstream both, and you'll also have to start thinking from that direction. Absolutely, without a doubt, uh, ESG does play a large role, and also the customer experience. While at, uh, on one side we are standardizing the experience, the customer expectation is not standard. We all have to be very, very wary of that. So how do we, I think there's a big role for technology to play in that. We yeah. should know which is the, we should know which is the customer we, are, we can cross-sell, which is the customer we cannot cross-sell. Because the customer expectation is not standard. So currently, whatever systems we are using are probably limited to billing and all that. But we should graduate to a point where we should know when a vehicle comes in or that particular customer comes in. We should know what is, how is that we have to deal with that particular customer. Right. I think that is where the future is because service is where the money is we can make. As Mr. Singh said, 30 to 50 percent. But are we getting that today? Probably not. How can we make max out of that 30 to 50 percent of that life cycle is the question. Right. So there's one customer who's probably contemplating buying himself an iPhone 
at the same time concentrating on whether I should go for that bike. And there's another customer uh, who's looking at an unorganized three-wheeler in, in the market, and, and many of them have proliferated. Uh, uh, you know, how do you see uh, this, uh, you know, due, due to the recent battery norms, there has been a sort of, uh, you know, consolidation, but how have you seen the emergence of, uh, you know, these unorganized three-wheeler players? Uh, do they uh, actually make you uh, get more competitive or do you see them as a threat or how do you see that, Mr. Graffi? <laughs> okay, uh, very, <laughs> very interesting question. Okay, um, it, is a, it is a matter of fact that uh, in three-wheeler space, uh, we can divide uh, basically the industry into parts, as you correctly remember. But it's the, the part that is, how to say, emerging out of a surface that is, um, how to say, composed by the players that have following homologation norms and are, how to say, uh, somehow uh, registering to, into, into SIAM number, registering to, to FADA number. So this is definitely having, having a, a dimension of uh, what is the part of the industry that is going to develop the demand of three-wheeler EV industry in, in the next period. And there is a substrate of, that goes without saying of a lot of, un, as you call it, unorganized players but we say also an, uh, so, uh, an unstructured uh, vehicle solution that somehow are not uh, always following the norms and the location norms, uh, but are defined as per Indian government. I see po very positively efforts done by, uh, how to say, the authorities in order to put, for example, uh, through IS 156 uh, homologation norm for battery safety, definitely a big step ahead in order to ensure that customer and, and uh, whoever is, is buying this kind of vehicle is protected in terms of safety of, of, of usage. But I, I think that going forward with the progressive evolution and the expectation of demand coming from consumer that are looking for always more in terms of performance, in terms of range, but also in terms of contents and features of a vehicle that would be a, a natural transition happening between the so-called organized sector to the structured sector and definitely with, uh, how to say, more compliance to homologation norms, battery norms, but also to the kind of expectation that naturally customers that are using this vehicle uh, every day for, for their mobility needs uh, definitely will, uh, will, uh, will, uh, will develop going forward. So uh, it has helped this uh, sector to create the demand, but I see that nature there will be a progressive shift uh, from this sector to the so-called structural sector. Right. So consolidation is a given. Uh, what do you think, Mr. Fukela? I mean, in the two-wheeler space as well, we saw a lot of these unorganized players who had emerged, but probably after the battery norms, we've started seeing many of them actually disappearing. Uh, did they wake the legacy players up? Uh, uh, you know, what, what, what do you think their role was and where are, where are we in terms of consolidation? I think consolidation is uh, uh, well underway. If I, if I just look at the, uh, the Wahan numbers, so outside of, let's say, the top four, which is, let's say, there's Aether, there's TVA, there's Ola, and there's Bajaj, uh, and if I count everybody else uh, as others, this number used to be about... 36, 38 percent a few months back is 20 percent last month, and this number is coming down month on month. So I think consolidation already is there. Uh, and finally, so I, I come from the mobile phone world, and I see a lot of similarities. If you remember 10, 12 years back, there were like 500 brands, right? And of them, maybe five remain, if at all, right? So it's very easy when, and very seductive for people, if you had a trader mentality to import, assemble, sell, make money, and get out. Right? Because it's easy money for short term. Uh, but that business doesn't last long. But it's opportunistic, people made money and they are what they are, right? So I think the, the shakeout already has begun, especially with fame coming down, prices going up, and now the true, now it reflects true market pricing. And product market fit is a function of the product and the pricing in which you sell it. Right. And suddenly a lot of people realize there was no product market fit, and, and therefore you see what you see. Right. So lastly, before we wrap up, uh, you know, you mentioned about mobile phone industry and uh, uh, something that I referred to a little while earlier, for today's prospective two-wheeler buyer, uh, you know, with the budget that he has, he, uh, the bike makers are competing with them, you know. How do you get into the psyche of today's new age buyer wherein there is penchant of, you know, uh, transitioning to a new gadget or a new bike very quickly? 
uh, how can you ensure stickiness and uh, in the process, uh, you know, what about the, uh, um, you know, does that create an opportunity for the deal of fraternity? I mean, just the fact that, uh, you know, the overall uh, life cycle and way the consumers are behaving and how do you deal with them and how can your dealership fraternity evolve themselves to deal with those new age customers? So, I think um, um, the way the, uh, the opportunity that EVs provide in terms of um, life, uh, the lifetime value and in context of replacement, right? I'm going to say something which will make me reasonably unpopular with the dealer fraternity because the model that we have for EVs is an antithesis of what we had in the automobile industry historically where every time you have, there is an upgrade to a product, you have to sell your old one and buy a new one. In the case of EVs, a lot of functionality is driven by software, right? And through over-the-air updates, we keep pushing out new features. Right. So reality is that anybody who's bought, uh, who owns a scooter today and bought it a year back, he has more features today than he had a year back. Right. So your, your, your richness of feature set keeps going up, and therefore your need to uh, upgrade keeps becoming low, which means the opportunity here is in the vast space right. more than the replacement space, right? Value added service. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Singh, I mean, this new age customer has to be seen differently and so should your channel. So, uh, in the ICE business at least, there's far more uh, segmentation and, and rightly so, it's developed over the years. And in that opportunity with the consumer, both in the, I would say there would be two parts of it. One part of it goes through the full funnel of, you know, first time buyers getting very attracted to even the most premium bikes wanting to uh, acquire that and we're seeing that in some of our recent launches. Uh, then there's the replacement buyer and there's the additional one, the one that wants something extra and something more uh, just for the lifestyle or the joy or whatever that is. And on the other side, there's still a huge opportunity. When you look at India, India is still about 50% penetrated from a two-wheeler perspective. It's not that high. On the Southeast Asia, if you look at, look at that map, the opportunity for headroom of growth is still huge. So there's a lot of first-time buyers who can probably get in there. And they're all driven by one thing, which is aspiration. And the only thing that constrains them is affordability, right? If we solve for that, I think the opportunity is huge. Yeah. All right, then. Thank you very much for listening in. That is where we wrap up. <laughs>
Okay, so. Thank you so much and we'll wait for a group photograph as well. I hope you all enjoyed the panel discussion. Can we please have a round of applause for our first panel this afternoon? A group photograph, sir, please. Thank you.